When I think about my own mission in life, it's really to create that student-centered education system around the world that allows all children to build their passions and fulfill their human potential wherever that may lie. And uh, as, as a recovering musician myself, I, I think it's exciting that we are able to spotlight that. So thank you so much uh, to the team uh, for, for organizing that performance. The uh, conversation I'm particularly excited today to have with you all is around thinking about that new architecture to support the 21st century learning environments. And in my work around creating these student-centered futures for all education systems around the world, what's become very important to me and very clear to me is that the space in which learning occurs is one of the biggest barriers at the moment to realizing this future and probably one of the biggest opportunities and leverage points to actually catapult us into that future. And so the work you all do, I think is unbelievably important in realizing this future. And so I'll talk through what I think that future is look, gonna look like today, uh, give you a little bit of uh, innovation theory mixed in from my roots with the Clayton Christensen Institute for Disruptive Innovation, uh, and then talk about the importance I see in space as being that catalyzer for these student-centered environments in the future. So I'll dive in with a maybe provocative statement, but that uh, schools were not built for learning. They were built to optimize for, any, for many things, but learning was actually not, in fact, one of them. And I, if you doubt it, I just want you to stop for a moment and reflect about your own schooling experience in third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, and while you do so, I want to tell you the story about a boy named Jack, uh, who in 2010, I got to sit in his class a few times in Los Altos, California. And Jack was one of these boys that had come into the fifth grade greatly behind in math. He had just concluded by that point that he was a child that would never, ever understand math. He was just destined to be bad at math, was sort of his conclusion. And uh, as a result, in a traditional math class, he would have been grouped into the bottom group. It would have been given some cute name. But that would have meant that he would not have seen algebra until high school. It would have impacted his college choices and, in many ways, determined his destiny. I want you to flip on the other side of uh, the equation as well. And imagine that uh, maybe a girl uh, has been to my hometown of Lexington, Massachusetts, where the shot heard around the world in the beginning of the Revolutionary War, with all, uh, with all deference to, my, uh, 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 to Murray and my UK friends. Uh, but uh, maybe she's visited there over the summer with her family, and then she goes back into her fifth grade classroom, and she's learning about US history and the causes it, uh, of the Revolutionary War. And she's sitting there excited for the first couple days. She's really enthusiastic because she can actually teach the class all that she learned on her trip to my hometown in Lexington, Massachusetts. And then on the third day, she's wondering, why are we still talking about this? And on the fourth day, she's really wondering, why are we still talking about this? And she's getting more and more bored and bored and bored and just tuning out over the course of a three-week unit on the Revolutionary War with material she already understands. So you have Jack on the one hand, growing bored and bewildered as the explanations in class are well above where he is and not at his level because of concepts he missed in years prior. And on the other hand, you have people who are bored and bewildered because they already have mastered material. And the question is, why does our education system work this way? And it was actually modeled uh, intentionally. We can bring the slides back up on the, uh, on, on the projection there. It was modeled intentionally to replicate the factory model era of the time when our mass education system was created. It was basically assumed that you could batch kids up by their date of manufacture, otherwise known as their birth year, put them in what we call classrooms and deliver content to them the same pace in the same way on the same day. And at the end of each unit or grade level, we would ship students out to the next unit, grade level, and so forth. And it was okay if some of them missed something because that was just the way the education system worked. And the challenge with, with this is that we've created a fixed time variable learning system. So we offer learning experiences for students, we test and assess, and students move on to the next grade, unit, subject, material, whatever it might be, and only afterward get results. And the challenge with this is it conflicts directly with what we know, that we all learn differently. We have different learning needs at different times. There have been lots of cognitive scientists and others who've theorized about these differences over the years, but what they don't disagree on is this. 
that some people learn something really quickly. Other people struggle with the concept. They really have to work with it until they've mastered the material. And the reason for these differences is we all have different what cognitive scientists call working memory. Literally the ability in the front of our brain and active memory to absorb new information and manipulate it in real time. And we all bring different background knowledge or long-term memory into every learning experience. And as a result, that child who already had been to Lexington, Massachusetts and considered the causes of the Revolutionary War is taking in the material in a very different way from a child who has not had that exposure to the Revolutionary War. And if you went too fast to try to accommodate uh, the person who's been to my hometown, you actually might lose the other person or have him develop misconceptions about the learning itself. Now, some people think about this in terms of learning styles. Cognitive scientists tend to think learning styles is actually not a thing, but that these differences profoundly impact the way we absorb and work with material and so forth. And we've long known that the best way to handle these differences is for everyone to have a tutor. Because a tutor experience, you can have feedback, rapid feedback, you can adjust for where you're getting something, where you're not, et cetera, et cetera. But the problem with uh, having a tutor for every child has simply been it's prohibitively expensive. We just can't afford it for most children, so the richest among us get access to it, but most people don't. And as a result, we get what educators call the Swiss cheese problem. Students develop holes in their learning, and the big problem is if I'm a teacher with 30 kids in my class, I know you all have Swiss, the Swiss cheese effect, but I have no idea which students have which holes. And the ability to personalize for all those differences is, dare I say, overwhelming. Now, despite all this, I think we should acknowledge that our education system worldwide has been tremendously successful for a long time. In the factory model era, what the United States in particular set up, the first universal education system, this mass schooling model, enabled us to reach all students so that almost all students got access to some education. The challenge is, as we're moving into the knowledge economy, that's no longer good enough. Those gaps, that boredom, students who drop out, a system that was built to sort students out, no longer is what we need. We need a, student, a system that develops the passions and potential in every child. And so I think what's exciting about right now is we're living in an historic opportunity to innovate, where I would say the first disruptive innovation uh, since the advent of the printing press uh, has come along and allowed us to transform how we do teaching and learning. Now, disruptive innovation, how many people have heard of the phrase disruptive innovation? How many people wish they hadn't? Keep your hands up. So disruptive innovation is this phrase that gets tossed around all the time by innovators in Silicon Valley, in the pages of the Wall Street Journal, and so forth. And I would say the majority of people misinterpret the idea. So I just want to level set us very quickly that when I use the phrase disruptive innovation, what I mean by that is an innovation that comes along that transforms a sector characterized by things that are complicated, expensive, deeply centralized and inaccessible, and therefore can only serve a limited few, into something that's far more affordable, convenient, accessible, and simple, such that it can bless the lives of many more people. And the way I like to represent it in simple terms is just through um, putting this series of concentric circles up on the screen. And what I want you to do is imagine that the innermost circle represents those people with the most expertise or wealth in a given field. And that as you go out these successive circles, it represents people who have less expertise or less wealth. And what we see in every sector is that before a new sector is created, everyone just sort of exists, exists on this outermost circle, sort of going about their business. In the computing world, before computers existed, if you wanted to do computation and calculations, we all just whipped out our slide rules on the spot and would do whatever computational problem we had in front of us. And then it was the advent of the mainframe computers in the 1940s, led by companies like IBM, uh, that created the computing industry. And for those of you that remember the history of computers, or maybe you've read Walter Isaacson's uh, Innovators, these machines were huge machines that would literally fill entire rooms and cost $2 million to buy. And so therefore, the majority of us didn't have the expertise to operate them or the wealth to afford them. And we just existed on these outer circles as what we call non-consumers, unable to access 
that innovation. The mini computer in the 1960s started to disrupt the world and decentralize it by offering a machine that was only a quarter million dollars. Still quite complicated about the size of that uh, podium there, so not particularly mini, but it extended some access. And then the really big disruptive innovation was the personal computer in the, 19, in the uh, late 1970s and early 1980s that for the first time, instead of you going to the computing center, the computer came to you at your desktop. It cost only a couple thousand dollars to, to buy one. It was so simple that someone even like myself could use it for the first time. I'm curious though, if we have an honest audience today, uh, how many of you remember the first personal computers? Ah, okay, thank you. I like honesty. So do you remember how er primitive those early machines were? You could, uh, the really early ones, you couldn't even do word processing, but as they progressed in the early 1980s, it was super primitive for word processing. And every once in a while, you'd go up there and you'd be typing along and stop and coax the stupid thing to catch up with your fingers. And that's true of all disruptive innovations, that the people in the inner circle look out at these new innovations and they're like, that's really primitive. It can't do the complicated problems that I need done today. But what they don't count on is that disruptive innovations predictably and reliably improve over time in unforeseen ways that get better and better and better. Uh, and as they do so, people in the inner circle start to flock out to the disruptive innovation because they're delighted with something that's good enough that's far more affordable, convenient, accessible, and simple. And that's what happened in the personal computer revolution. By the late 1980s, it was good enough that it could do a lot of the complicated calculations, computations, computing tasks for which you needed a mainframe before, and people rushed out in droves and the volume collapsed, and that's how transformation occurred. Now, of course, transformation, disruptive innovation is continued, and you all have computers in your pockets, I suspect, that if you get bored of me at any time, you can whip them out and become productive again, so that's a great thing. Now, what's interesting is that I would submit online learning is the first disruptive innovation, as I said, since the advent of the printing press in education, uh, and fundamentally allows us to transform not just the delivery, but also the interaction of how learning occurs. And so in our, our book, Disrupting Class, Clay Christensen and I uh, predicted in 2008 by the, by, uh, that online learning was growing in such a way as disruptive innovations do, that by 2019, 50% of all high school courses would have a strong online learning component as a part of them. When the book came out, I think most people thought we were crazy. Now, if you look at most of the research of who's using education technology, 60, 70% of teachers say they use it significantly in their classrooms and it feels like it's starting to come true. What's exciting about this is not the fact that we're seeing online learning get adopted though, I would say. I would say that it's what online learning and more generally what innovation enables. And that we shouldn't be excited about innovation for its own sake, but that we're focused squarely on does the innovation help every single student succeed? And so to that end, I think online learning is exciting because it makes a few things possible at scale. The first one is what I would call the rise of K-12 blended learning. And that is that the vast majority of students are not going to learn in virtual environments at home online. It's just not gonna happen. There's a reason homeschooling is a problem because it's the word home. Someone has to be with your child as they learn. And so school buildings, as these unbelievable community centers are gonna to continue to be the place where the vast majority of learning occurs. But it will be in blended environments. And so we created a definition for what blended learning is. Uh, it's somewhat technical, but the basic idea is that a student's learning at least in part through online learning, not wholly. I think that would be not a great thing for a variety of reasons, but uh, at least in part through online learning where they have some control, and this is the critical part, of the time, place, path, or pace of the learning. It occurs at least in part in a school building with, with teachers. And the, the different experiences that a child has as they learn are connected in some way within any given subject or domain. And what I mean by that is what you do online is connected to what you do offline. And what that means is uh, when I was in school in the 1980s, uh, if a teacher kicked me out of the class to go play Oregon Trail for 10 or 20 minutes. How many people remember Oregon Trail? Yeah, okay. Uh, 
that was not blended learning, right? The number of squirrels I killed in my uh, march over to Oregon had nothing to do with whatever my social studies or math or science lesson was. And that's the big idea, that these experiences have to be connected somehow to create a coherent and cohesive experience. And that's blended learning. Importantly, that means that just putting an electronic whiteboard in front of students and broadcasting le lessons to them, it's not blended learning because you haven't changed the pedagogical foundation of the learning environment itself. And just equipping students with one-to-one -one, uh, tablets or digital textbooks or the like, that's not blended learning either. It might enable blended learning, but just because you have the devices doesn't mean you're actually doing it. It hasn't been that pedagogical shift. The other thing I'll just say very clearly is because, just because you're doing blended learning doesn't mean it's, you're doing it well or that it's a good thing. It's how you do it that matters, not that you're doing it. And we'll get into that in a moment. Now, there's lots of different models of blended learning. This is a confusing chart that we created just to capture that complexity of how many different flavors of blended learning we were seeing. But basically at the top, and you have this on your tables as well, uh, brick and mortar schools meet online learning. They have a baby whose name is blended learning. Uh, and then blended learning has lots of offspring uh, that are different models of how you can do blended learning. And uh, often I don't walk through these models, but I think as people thinking about facilities, it's interesting to think about this in terms of how you would purpose, built, uh, purpose build some of these spaces to accommodate different types of instructional models that school leaders might decide to adopt. So this one is a station rotation model. It's very similar to elementary school classroom design that occurs through much of the world already where students are rotating among certain centers. Big idea is just one of those centers now is an online learning station where some subset of students is working on computers. You don't need one-to-one -one laptops. You can take a group of 30 students and divide them into three groups of 10, and then students can get way more individualized attention from the teacher in a small group setting, and they can be dynamically uh, regrouping students based on the data from the online learning to constantly be creating different types of groups depending on the experience they want to facilitate. And so this is what it looks like in a school in uh, Los Angeles, California. You can see the students on the rug uh, with the teacher getting a lot more opportunities to be active learners, to talk actively in class, to develop their uh, uh, pr presentation skills, to be focused on what they need to succeed, and then students in the back for a few minutes uh, out of the day doing their online learning. Lab rotation uh, is, is a little bit less these days in the United States. It seems to be growing internationally more uh, because of the presence of computers uh, in schools today. But basically, instead of rotating um, within the classroom, you rotate to a learning lab. You have the flipped classroom that I suspect many of you are sick of hearing of. Uh, but a lot of teachers love these environments because it's an easy way to get into blended learning. I think of it as the gateway drug into blended learning. Uh, where teachers can just create an online lesson or find one that students can go home and do the lesson at home. And then when they come into the learning environment, they have a very active learning experience where they're doing projects or practice with their fellow peers and the teacher is there, right there to answer questions and so forth. Uh, individual rotation where every student has an individualized playlist through the online learning and group experiences and teachers are really getting to spend time working with them in small groups, seminar rooms, or one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Uh, the flex model, which we see in a lot of schools now where students are actually flexibly and fluidly moving through different learning experiences as they decide that they need it. So if they want to be working online on their social studies, they get to do it. They then switch over to math after 30 minutes and then they jump into a peer group uh, somewhere else because they actually need some peer tutoring to try to figure out what they can understand in mathematics. And it looks like a lot of the modern workforces of today, these new learning environments. And they use uh, various, uh, uh, you know, this is a school that hacked its current space to create these different learning environments and different spaces for different types of learning, whether it's collaborative space or uh, uh, project-based learning or individual uh, personalized learning uh, on, on the computer itself. I'm going to flip through these uh, and get to the question, though. So blended learning is a thing. Why should we be excited about it? And from my perspective, the first thing is it enables us to personalize at scale. Students can uh, move at their own path and pace as need be. And you hear right now a lot of uh, talk in the uh, education ether, I would say, around the rise of personalized learning. 
foundations like the Gates Foundation, Chan Zuckerberg, and others talk about it. Everyone has their own definition for what personalized learning is or isn't. Uh, and from my perspective, it sort of misses the point. The point is really not to think of personalized learning as a noun, but as a verb, that we're personalizing for students so that they can make progress in their educational journeys. And the right kind of personalization depends what you're trying to achieve, but it's really to handle the fact that students have different learning needs at different times. And there's lots of different ways to personalize. I've put up some of these here on the screen, but the big idea is that some of these are productive at certain points in time, and some of these are counterproductive. Giving students voice and choice over their learning objectives can be really important when you're in, the, in, in, in a particular project unit, perhaps, and giving them that uh, ability to goal set and develop agency and pursue a passion. But it could be counterproductive if a teacher's not there to direct them towards something productive. I don't think any of us would be thrilled about a second grader that chooses to spend the entire year uh, focused on underwater basket weaving, for example. Right? And so thinking about where we do personalization and how we do it, I think is the right conversation we need to be having, not just treating it as a blanket good unto itself. But the exciting thing about the technology piece of it is it enables inherent personalization because it's inherently modular. I can move at the path and pace that makes sense for me, and you can move at a very different path and pace as you master material. This is a screenshot uh, from the Khan Academy that offers free uh, online learning lessons and exercises and assessments. And uh, it's from 2010, from Jack's classroom in Los Altos, California, that I was telling you about in the beginning. And the really cool thing about uh, Jack's experience was that he didn't have the traditional experience. His teacher decided to experiment with a blended learning design that year, a station rotation model. And they allowed all the children to go back to the beginning of mathematics to basically figure out where were their gaps in learning and fill those in. And it turned out in the case of Jack that the reason he was so far behind in fifth grade math was that he had missed some pretty basic concepts in second and third grade math. And as he went back to the beginning of math and started to work through it, he started to find those gaps, fill them in. And what had happened was in the middle of a three week unit, you know, he had been about to master double digit addition and the teacher had said time to move on because it's the end of the three weeks. And so as that happened several times to him, he had just fallen further and further behind. Well, he was now able to plug those holes, and at the time of the screenshot, day 70 of their school year, Jack was no longer third from the bottom of his math class, he was third from the top of his math class, working well above grade level. And you just realize how poorly our existing system was designed around learning, and the educational malpractice that was occurring to people like Jack, and how this blended learning design allows us to break out of it. Now, the other reason I think that blending is, is really exciting is to be able to do competency-based learning or mastery-based learning at scale. And this is basically the idea that we, instead of having a system that is time-based, where the time is fixed and everyone has variable learning, that we can actually flip that equation and move to one where the learning is fixed and the time becomes variable. So we still offer learning experiences to students, we still test and assess, but now, uh, students get real-time or interactive uh, feedback on where they actually are, and that informs what they do next, and they only progress to the next body of material as they actually can demonstrate real mastery of the subject matter in hand. And so that really flips us around and gets out of that Swiss cheese problem, and I think it allows us to rethink some pretty exciting things within education. And the first one that I just listed here is the future of assessments that I think can move away from the summative end of year tests, the fifth grade test, for example, where it's basically an autopsy on what percentage of your students passed and what percentage of your students didn't, to one in which we give much smaller, more frequent assessments that break the trade-off between summative assessments that occur at the end of the year and formative assessments that are to inform what a student knows and can do and help inform what a teacher does in their learning journey. Because in a competency-based world, every single assessment you give is both for and of learning. It tells you, did I master it and can I move on? And if I didn't, what do I need to keep working on so that I can really master it? The other thing is, I think it allows us to enlarge our sense of outcomes beyond just 
notions of academic achievement that accountability era has largely focused on, but a lot of people are increasingly talking about these so-called non-cognitive skills. Why they're non-cognitive, I'm not sure, but uh, things like grit, perseverance, student agency, and the like that are really, really important for student life success in college, career, and beyond. And what's clear to me is that you actually cannot tackle these things in our traditional system at scale. And the reason is this. If I'm a child in the middle of a three-week unit working at something, regardless of whether I have put in the work and mastered the material, at the end of the three weeks, I move on to the next unit. And so the signal that the school sends to me every single day is it actually doesn't matter which effort you put into it. It doesn't matter if you have a growth mindset. It doesn't matter if you persevere. Because at the end, you're gonna make progress. Whereas if you flip that to a mastery-based or competency-based learning world, the message is you don't get to move on until you put in the effort. And yes, you will fail. And then you'll just get to keep working at it. And you'll get to pick yourself up and learn from your failures, which is how all of us learn in life. We learn from mistakes. And what you want to do is avoid catastrophic failure in favor of fast failure to unlock that mindset shift in all students. And so my submission is if we're really serious about these social emotional needs of children, that we need to shift the actual system itself away from a time-based system into a competency-based one. Now, the big question, of course, is will we fulfill the potential of this moment and help all children unlock uh, the discovery and building of their passions and fulfilling their potential? And I think there's some scary news on this. I've just put up a list of, uh, I think it's seven things that I'm worried about uh, as we march into this world. And I'm not gonna go through all these, but you'll see the top one that I've bolded there, which is the school building design itself. Because I think as long as we remain trapped in a model where we think that uh, egg crate school designs with double-barreled hallways is the way that learning should occur, we are trapping ourselves in that factory model mindset and actually reinforcing it rather than disrupting it. And so I think the question we ought to be asking is, what are school buildings for? And I think this is the question you all want to ask, and it's the charge I would have you ask the educators with, which, with whom you work. And think about moving beyond that just conventional design to spaces that, yes, are safe, clean, and, and so forth, but that they're also inspiring and flexible and enable that personalization that we all hope to see. It's fascinating going out there and looking at the classrooms that you all have set up in this space because I think intuitively and inherently they're building in these ideas and principles into them. And we need to help our school communities think about the pedagogical change so that they can take advantage of these. And so that we can build schools that I would say are far leaner, more affordable, greener than those that we have had before. I've put up an example of intrinsic schools that very purpose-built built around a particular blended learning model with spaces that are built for very particular types of learning activities in Chicago. It costs far less than a traditional school building to build with the same union labor at, at the heart of building it. It's a far greener building and I think far more purpose-built for the sorts of learning experiences that they wanted to see that unlock this ability for personalization. And so it starts to move us beyond a mobile, structured, limited personal space and, and uh, uh, traditional schools and classrooms into learning environments that are far more mobile and flexible and fluid and so forth. Now, I'll just make one other statement here before I move on from this slide, which is I also think this should and could end, spell the end of the classroom as we know it. And instead, we'll start thinking about learning environments in schools as opposed to classrooms that implies age-graded uh, uh, people sorted by their age sitting with other peers rather than fluid, robust environments that cause lots and lots of peer-to-peer -peer interactions where I can learn from someone older than me and that person has leadership opportunities as well. And we can be learning at our own pace and path. But we can have very productive interactions. And how would we create those spaces for that is the question that I think we ought to be asking ourselves. Now, there is a cautionary tale which is that a lot of people I think hear me speak and they say, well, we tried that already in the 70s with the open classroom movement and it largely failed. What's different, Michael? And I would say there's two things that I would take from this. One is 
fundamentally in the open classroom movement, the technology was still whole class lecture. One lesson plan for the entire class. And so if I'm broadcasting myself and you're over there with no wall trying to work individually or trying to do your own lesson, it fundamentally creates noise and interference. And so teachers were right to rebuild the walls and, and erect classrooms again. The technology has changed now such that we don't have to have that same whole classroom environment. The second thing I take from it is that spaces can't be infinitely flexible. And, and we just like we can't have one size fits all lesson plans, we can't have one size fits all spaces either. And you all know this better than I do. But form following function, I think, is really important. And so really being very intentional about, hey, this space that we've created is for collaborative project-based learning. And this space over here is for small group seminars and conversations and the like. And this space here is really purpose-built for that personalized learning that we want to see occurring and peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, teaching and interactions and so forth. And how would we think about that? And so from my perspective, if form does follow function, it goes to the heart of when we think about how we design schools, whether that's retrofitting or building new, we have to help our communities work through uh, a design process to really figure out what do they want teaching and learning to look like in the future and how do we break them out of what school has always looked like so that we can create these new designs that catalyze that future. And that's the charge I, I hope to give to you and I'll walk through this design methodology in a moment, but please, please don't accept just stamping out a newer looking version of the old mausoleums to the past as you continue to build schools. I implore you to work with the uh, communities in which you work to really reimagine the use of space so that we can unlock this learning. Now, I think that starts with being clear about what do we want school to do for our community? What's our rallying cry? What's our mission? What are we trying to produce in our learners? Think through what's the team we need to bring together to design those school experiences, and then be very deliberate about the student experiences that we want every single student to have every single day. And that doesn't mean we want them to have 45 minutes of mathematics followed by 45 minutes of social studies followed by 45 minutes of science, but thinking more robustly about that. And so I put up here the example of Summit Public Schools based out in California and also the state of Washington that I think has maybe been the most deliberate about thinking through this set of student experiences that they want their children to have every single day, week, month, and throughout the school year. And so their mission, their rallying cry starts around this, preparing students to be successful learners, able to goal set, make choices, uh, in, in the 21st century and live productive lives. That, and this set of six things is really at the heart of what they mean by that. So that's their rallying cry. And then they say, okay, to do that, to accomplish our goals for the kids, we need to, that means, uh, help them with goal setting so that they can be drivers of their own lives, help them with the cognitive knowledge, the content knowledge, and the habits of success that they will need in the future. That's what we need to do. But to do that, we need to create an experience that's intrinsically motivating so that they want to show up here every single day excited and motivated to learn. How do we do that? And from my perspective, Summit has basically put together eight experiences that they say are critical for students to experience. So student agency or ownership of their own work, individual mastery, right, over every single thing. So that notion of embedding mastery-based or competency-based learning. Access to actionable data and feedback. Because it's really interesting, you'll sometimes hear data-driven decision-making in education. The research is very clear. When we give data to students and they have no ability to do anything with that data, they can't use it to improve performance as feedback to help themselves, it's incredibly demotivating to learning. And it actually turns them off to education. But when we present it in a way that gives it to them in an actionable way, that they can improve performance and get better and better, it's incredibly motivating to learning. The fourth one is transparency in the learning goals. So not just in the uh, sequence of a given year, but actually what's the full map, some had asked, to what a learner needs to be able to know and do to graduate college ready. For them, they needed to provide sustained periods of quiet reading time because children that they serve don't have access to that at home. 
uh, they needed to give a meaningful um, uh, work experience to their children uh, uh, and, and mentoring experiences that would unlock social capital and, and, and the power of meeting new people that would expose them to new fields and, and possibilities of who they could be. And finally, positive group experiences in which they could really work together and, and build that fun of learning in a cohesive way. And so out of that, they built individualized playlists, so every child would be going on their learning journey in their own way, their own path and pace. And this sequence is now free to any educator around the country. I think it's in about 400 schools today, totally free with different learning pathways for every child, where they only move on once they master material. They would go through this personalized learning cycle where they set a goal, they plan how they're gonna learn, they go ahead and learn, they show evidence of their learning and then they reflect and then they go through it over and over again so that they perfect this ability to own their own learning in 16 hours of personalized learning time uh, a week. They get uh, their whole scope and sequence of what they're supposed to do revealed to them at the very beginning. And so that they always know, am I on track? Am I ahead of where I'm supposed to be or am I behind in every single subject? Rapid and actionable and rich feedback that allows them to improve performance. And then they've totally pulled apart the school schedule. You see here large blocks of time for project-based learning where students could work in groups actually applying the knowledge that they had learned in the online playlists. And then students in turn would develop a need to know that would help them understand why the learning that they were doing was so important for the projects. And so it sort of fed on itself. And you can see two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon of project-based time, just an hour or two a day where students were actually doing the personalized learning time solitarily, uh, excuse me, individually on the computers. This is a very collaborative experience that they've set up with a lot of student choice and agency throughout it. And on Fridays, the whole day was exclusively set up for personalized learning time, where every single student would meet for 15 minutes with a mentor. So they were always getting that one-on-one -on -one time that the traditional school schedule with its guidance counselor and 300 students per guidance counselor or 400 students per guidance counselor just doesn't afford. And then finally, they, uh, eight weeks per year, they send students out of school uh, on expeditions in the community where they actually take externships, internships, and so forth with community uh, organizations around town where they actually get into meaningful work experiences with mentors and projects uh, in the community itself uh, and learn why what they're doing is so important to their futures and get exposure to careers that they otherwise never would have exposure to. And this occurs off-site and then the teachers use this time as professional development time. So once you've designed an experience like that and thought through, gee, that looks really, really different and, and has very different precepts at it, you start to think about the teaching experience and all of a sudden you realize the teacher's not gonna be at the front of the room lecturing. Instead, they're gonna be mentoring, facilitating, rich discussions, projects, giving feedback, uh, mentoring, uh, uh, serving the role of counselor for a, a lot of the social emotional needs that children have, a lot of other things that's not delivering content. And all of a sudden you say, does there need to be a front of the room if that's the case? It all of a sudden changes your notion of space. And once you've designed that, then that's where you start taking the content technology facilities, choose your instructional model, and start to use those things to serve the student and teacher experiences that you want to create to unlock this mo motivation and unleash this potential. And then you start to think about the culture very seriously and then testing and learning because whatever you design on paper won't actually fully work, but prototyping, right? Prototyping so that you can figure out, is this the vision we want and how would we achieve it? And then designing from there. And I think that vision is so different for most schooling communities, but it creates so many opportunities for school design out of that that are desperately needed. I look forward to the day where we don't see communities building a 20th century school building anymore, and that all school buildings are uniquely constructed for the learning vision that that community wants to see unleashed for its kids so that every single one of them can build their passion and fulfill their potential. I think that moment is within our grasp now. It's not a guarantee. It's gonna rely on all of you here to intentionally shape that future and build it so that we can fulfill the potential of this moment for the potential of our kids. As someone who has uh, two daughters, 
uh, uh, starting to go through the school system and, and seeing the, the, the young women up here performing, uh, it, it makes me emotional because I just think about how those children are getting to explore their passions and build their p potential and see who they are and develop themselves. And I think every child deserves that opportunity and, and it rests on all of you in this room to help make that a reality for every single kid, not, the, not just the lucky few who have an experience like that. So I commend you for what you do on a daily basis. I thank you and I hope that you'll join me in this mission to transform all of schooling. I appreciate it very much. Thank you.